My name is Mary Catherine Blackwood. I'm 18 years old and I live with my sister Constance. I've often thought that with any luck at all, I could have been born a werewolf because the two middle fingers on both my hands are the same length, but I've had to be content with what I had. I dislike washing myself and dogs and noise. I like my sister Constance and Richard Plantagenet and Amanita Phalloides, death cup mushroom. Everyone else in my family is dead. Hello, welcome to Spread Book Joy. I'm Jack and I want to talk to you about this American Gothic classic, We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson. And I want to talk a bit about the film as well, which was adapted in 2018. I'm also going to talk about spoilers, but I'll give you a big warning before I do that. So there'll be a spoiler free uh, synopsis, I suppose you could call it before that, and a little bit of an outline about the book. So this is uh, Shirley Jackson's last book. It's the first Shirley Jackson book I've read. I read it as part of the FOMO book club, which is a book club I run with my friends, Alice and Gemma, and I'll link their channels and our FOMO book club video announcement of all the books we're reading in the description box below if you wanna join us. But this is the shortest book we've read so far, I believe, or the shortest adult fiction book we've read. And it's 150 something pages and it's, the book we've talked about the most. And I've since gone back and reread it and it's a work of genius. I absolutely loved this book. Uh, so I just want to talk about it. I was going to talk about it when I finished rereading the whole thing, but I just can't, I want to talk about it now. So just to give you a bit of a synopsis, it was written, I think in 1962 and Shirley Jackson died not long after writing this and it was her final piece. And it is an American Gothic classic is considered an American Gothic classic. American Gothic, I kind of had an idea of what I thought that was and um, I looked up some things. American Gothic literature has um, common themes including irrationality versus logic in the form of the characters, uh, the past impacting the present, reality being blurred into fantasy, elements of the macabre and the supernatural, um, and then often like themes that are very American uh, to do with things like religious anxiety and stuff like that, which doesn't really feature in this so much, though I suppose you could argue it does a little bit, but one feature of um, another genre, which I think is a subgenre of American Gothic, which is Southern Gothic. I'm still not clear on the difference apart from Southern Gothic is generally set in the South, um, but Southern Gothic literature often features the downfall and decay of wealthy people and small towns and has things like gothic mansions. So it has that element too, because the opening that I read you, uh, was read to you at the start of this book, opening of the book, we learn about the narrator, a little bit about her, Mary Catherine Blackwood. She's known as Mary Cat, and she lives with her sister Constance and their sickly uncle in their old fam the Blackwood family mansion, which is dilapidated, it is decaying, it's fallen on hard times, as is the Blackwood family. So you kind of get this, um, like you do when the house is a feature of any great book, you kind of get this feeling of, as the house decays, the family's decaying, and it's kind of like this mirroring thing that you get going on. So the Blackwoods live on the outskirts of a small town. They've clearly been the prominent wealthy family in this town for a long time, and they are not well liked, but there are many reasons behind it. But in our first chapter, we meet Mary Cat as she's going into town to get their essentials, which include food and books. So I love the fact that there's a nod to books being an essential. So she's going to get library books and she's going to get food. And she does this because their uncle is uh, too ill he, he's being looked after um, and Constance, the older sister, who's I think nine years older than Mary Cat, she is, she doesn't leave the house. So Shirley Jackson introduces us to Mary Cat while she's going through the town. And as she's walking through the town, we get the, um, her talking to us about the town, the townspeople, her feelings about them, which um, she is not happy walking through this town. There's a lot of hostility towards her and she, copes with this by playing a game in her head where she gives herself, I can't remember if she gives herself points, but she, for managing to get things done quickly and without anyone interfering or interrupting her or saying anything to her. And we discover these little bread, through these sort of breadcrumb trail of, of clues that Mary Cat gives us, that Shirley Jackson gives us through Mary Cat, who, as we go on, we learn is not the most reliable of narrators because she might not be the most logical, rational person so we get in those you know themes of rationality and, and, and versus logic so Mary Cat 
uh, it starts to give us drip feed us these clues as to something that's happened at the house with her family and we've you know heard at the start in the first paragraph everybody else in my family is dead so we start to learn what's happened to the Blackwood family and why the people in the town are so hostile towards Mary Cat and the rest of the Blackwoods that are left yeah and it's it's a really great opening chapter and it's even better on a reread because once you finish reading the book, you'll kind of want to go back and read it again to see just how cleverly plotted this book is and looking at all the hints that Shirley Jackson gives us for the things that are to happen. But yes, so we're talking about those themes of irrationality versus logic and reality versus fantasy. And Mary Cat is a really unreliable narrator and she is uh, she sees the world in the way she wants to see it and she tries to she has these sort of rituals and ways of keeping herself safe and uh, keeping her family safe and she must perform these rituals uh, like such as the game that she plays walking through town but Mary Cat sees everything in, through the eyes of kind of like a fairy tale and so we get a lot of fairy tale motifs running throughout this which I found delightful so it's kind of like we have always lived in the castle is kind of like a subverted fairy tale so if you kind of were inside mary cat's head and believe in the things that she believes in in the superstitions and the magic and the things she does to keep her family safe she makes these spells she has these rituals and her sister constance she sees and straight away in the very first few pages she talks about her sister as a princess and constance and mary cat are kind of polar opposites in the way they present physically and to other people and in personality uh, in some ways and then they've got a lot of similarities which become more apparent as the book goes on but they are each other's best friend um, Mary Cat is happy if it is just her and Constance um, she's trying to be kinder to her uncle as she keeps telling us in the start of the book so it always makes you wonder how she was treating him before or why she needs to be kinder to him and we have this kind of codependent relationship between these two sisters who are isolated and troubled so that's the setup of the book I don't want to say anything more about it apart from the cleverness of the writing the dark comedy because there is a lot of black comedy and humour in here that I found funny. I don't know if everybody else would find it funny, but I found it quite darkly funny. And I just, I love the amount of slow revealed information that you're drip fed and you're just getting more and more into finding out what's happened to the family. So yeah, you can see why it's a classic. I wish I'd read it sooner. So it's well worth your time. I am going to talk about spoilers in a minute, but just to mention that I watched the film, the 2018 adaptation, and it was okay, actually. I really enjoyed it. It's very different from the book in ways that I can't talk about without spoiling the book, but the aesthetic is really good. The acting is excellent. The actors are Tysa or Tysa Farmiga plays Mary Cat. Alexandra Dodaro plays Constance, uh, Crispin Glover plays their uncle Julian and then we have a really amazing turn by the fourth character that comes into the book because Mary Cat says that she feels a change coming and the change comes in the form of their cousin who turns up to um, their house and their cousin Charles Blackwood is played by Sebastian Stan in the film so really good now i'm going to talk spoilers so spoiler warning so yes i absolutely love this book so we find out that constance has killed um or has been accused of murdering everyone else in the family there was a poisoning incident constance loves to cook she takes on the role of this carer she's clearly very motherly very caring she's obviously very physically attractive and pleasant and people like to be around constance and as the book goes on we discover that the family died um, of poisoning so the mother their mother and father and their uncle's wife and I think that was it so they're all sitting around having dinner and there was poison in the sugar bowl Constance always prepares the food Constance does not get poisoned Mary Cat was sent to bed without her supper so she hasn't been poisoned and Mary Cat was this happened six years before Mary Cat was 12 and then Uncle Julian has been poisoned but it didn't kill him but it's left him extremely ill and Uncle Julian it keeps going over and over the incidents because he's writing down what happened but clearly his memory's affected he's mentally traumatized so he keeps going over and over the story and the day and the last day and what happened and what they ate and everything else and Constance is just so sweet with him and she answers his questions and though she's probably answered the questions over and over again and listens to his theories and listens to what he thinks and she takes care of them both by feeding them a lot she is a wonderful cook and she feeds them constantly that's her sort of way of showing love 
Mary Cat loves Constance so much and she just wants to keep them together. No one else coming into their home. She wants to stay in their castle. So talking about the fairy tale elements of it, we've got Constance, the princess, the golden princess. Mary Cat is dark, uh, dark haired, I believe, and she's very strange and she presents quite oddly uh, in the way that she presents herself to people. She's very quiet and very reserved and um, socially awkward and uh, they're, so they're stuck in their castle and they kind of see their home as their castle with their protector so Mary Cat from the start when she gets back to the grounds that their, car, their, their mansion is in she feels like she's safe and uh, their home is all important to them and protecting the home and Mary Cat has she's dotted around constantly around the place she's dotted these protective amulet type things that she's made herself like she's nailed a book to a tree she's buried some coins she's got all of these spells she has magic words that she repeats to herself when she thinks something's going bad is going to happen so there's constant fairy tale references throughout and in the first chapter alone she talks about having wishing she'd been born a werewolf she talks about the evil people in the village so she sees the people in the village as evil so this kind of feels like a subverted fairy tale where in Mary Cat's head, she has got magical powers. Her sister is a princess. They live in a castle. They're trying to protect themselves. She casts these spells. She does these magic rituals. She has magical objects. She has magical words that she says. And she talks about the village. And she even says um, in, in the second page, um, there were books in our house, of course. Our father's study had books covering two walls, but I liked fairy tales and books of history and Constance liked books about food. So we learn constantly when she tells us these things about these characters. Um, she talks about the village and she says, in this village, the men stayed young and did the gossiping and the women aged with grey evil weariness and stood silently waiting for the men to get up and come home. It kind of struck me as very fairy tale like uh, she talks about making an offering of jewellery out of gratitude because she managed to have a good day. Um, so just it's just constantly scattered throughout. Um, she thinks about noise driving away demons. Her whole view of the world is through this kind of lens of fairy tales and magic. And so if we're in Mary Cat's head and this were a fairy tale, the villagers are kind of the evil villagers. She's, Mary Cat is a witch, um, but she never calls herself a witch in the book. And you know, fairy tales are full to the brim of stories of, of sisters, aren't they? And at the very end of the story, uh, we discover, of course, that Mary Cat has been um, withholding some of the truth to us. Constance didn't poison the, the family. Mary Cat poisoned them. She put poison in the sugar because she knew Constance didn't take sugar and she was sent to bed without her supper. We're never quite told why Mary Cat poisoned her family. We're kind of given hints that her father told her off and sent her to bed without supper and that was why she was... Um, Put, put, put poison in the sugar but we're not quite told directly what happened that night why Mary Cat poisoned them but we do find out that Constance knew she did it Constance reveals in the end that Mary Cat did it um, the reveal is comes after their cousin Charles turns up and Charles Blackwood tries to take control of the house he tries to instigate some uh, rules and routine because Mary Cat has been allowed to go to bed when she likes, eat when she likes, sleep wherever she likes. She's kind of running wild in this house um, with Constance feeds her whatever she wants, whenever she wants it. So if she wants cake for, for her dinner, she'll give her a cake um, with pink icing or whatever. I can't, I think the line was. But Charles Blackwood turns up and he immediately sees that he can he kind of takes control of Constance. We had some discussion in our book club around whether Charles Blackwood was actually just trying to put some rules into place and actually was a decent person. He seemed like he was being controlling, but he was coming across this situation where Uncle Julian is just getting more and more disturbed and traumatized and harder to take care of and probably should be in a home. And he's telling them he should be in a home. Um, you, Constance, are, you know, you, you need looking after and Mary Cat needs some rules and she needs some discipline. But actually, he comes across in the book, there is an ambiguity to it, but he comes across to me as very threatening. Um, and he says things to Mary Cat when they're on their own about how he's going to get rid of her. Um, in terms, like He hints at it. And I think he's very threatening. And for me, the thing that swung it as to why Charles um, was not 
necessarily having their best interests at heart is because the girls are living off of the money that's in their father's safe and they were rich so they just take what they need and they go and buy what they need and then that's what they have and they're just living off of this fortune that's in the house and he knows that's there and he wants to find it and when they finally come to a, a big a head about it Charles and Mary Cat Mary Cat sets fire to his bed and then the whole house burns down the villagers turn up like a mob they ransack the house they're seeking out the girls so this is where it gets very you know in terms of like gothic horror kind of like a mob from the village with pitchforks almost turns up and Charles does nothing to help or to save them he just wants the safe taken out of the house and yeah so for me he was kind of the villain of it all but at the end Mary Cat and Constance are left Uncle Julian dies Mary Cat and Constance are left in their dilapidated house there are parts of it that are not destroyed so they board themselves up in there and then the villagers come and leave them these offerings of food which is super fairy tale like you can imagine this local legend springing up around this house and they hear children daring each other to go up and touch the door um, where obviously these two wicked sisters are living and at the end Mary Cat's got her wish. It's just her and Constance and they're in this house and she says at the very end, oh, I'm so very happy. And yeah, that's kind of where we leave them. The film, very, very different. Because this book was so open to interpretation in some ways, there's a lot to discuss about why Mary Cat might have poisoned her family, why whether Constance is actually as bad as Mary Cat because she knew and she still loves Mary Cat and protects her and why, why it all happened in the first place. Lots to discuss. Also the discussion around cousin Charles and whether he was a good person or not. But in the film, they do not leave any ambiguity. So I love the aesthetic of the film. I thought the film looked really good. I thought it looked the way I would imagine the, um, the, the house to look, the grounds, the town. I really loved the characters as they were portrayed in it. I thought the acting was superb. Crispin Glover I thought was a strange choice for Uncle Julian, but he did it brilliantly. He's a great actor anyway, but I just thought he was a bit too intense, but he wasn't. He played it perfectly intensely. Sebastian Stan as cousin Charles is creepy and slimy in the extreme, and there is no ambiguity. In the opening lines of the film, Mary Cat says, my family is dead, a change is coming. But in the scene we meet Mary Cat and she's listening to the opening, uh, she's listening to Richard III on vinyl, and Richard's saying, and thus I clothe my naked villainy with odd old ends stolen out of holy writ, and seemed a saint when most I played a devil, and that's playing in the background. So she doesn't say she loves Richard Plantagenet in the opening, and what I loved about that opening is she says she loves Richard Plantagenet and Richard Plantagenet rightly or wrongly history and Shakespeare portrayed him to to have been a villain who murdered his family <laughs> murdered his nephews and, and 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 I think his brother basically he was painted as the blackest villain possible now there is a Richard III society who will dispute this and say that actually he was given a bad press and it was never proven that he did any of these things. So I'm not getting into the whole Richard Plantagenet argument, but I just love the fact that that opening with that, she's saying, I love Richard Plantagenet. And then in the opening of the film, we've got this scene, which is where um, Richard III is glorifying in his evil nature and declaring he will stop at nothing in his ambition to be king. And he has no conscience at all. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what's playing in the background of the opening of the film. And then we see these newspaper headlines which tell us straight away in the opening scene what's happened to the family. We don't learn that the family were poisoned, we don't learn what happened to them straight away in the book, and that's the beauty of the book, but we're told it in the film. We're told the family are poisoned through newspaper headlines um, from the very beginning. So that is something that we don't need to find out. So we know straight away why the people in the village are being hostile towards them, why the Constance won't come out and that kind of thing. So that's kind of, for me, you're giving away the beauty of the book by doing that. The other parts that are different, Cousin Charles is not ambiguous about whether he's good or bad or not. He is just downright evil. And the night that Mary Cat sets fire to the house, he actually physically attacks her. He physically attacks her. I think he tries to physically attack Constance. I can't quite remember, but they, that doesn't happen in the book. But I think what they're trying to do is give us this final, like no ambiguity because it's a film. We don't want to think too much or too deeply about it. Um, and we want to know who to root for. So she's, even though she's a murderer, I think the film wants you on the side of the main character, right? Because that's what they do. Editing Jack here. I completely forgot to mention that a big plot twist and difference in the film from the book is that Charles is uh, comes back in the book 
and tries to persuade Constance to come to the door and he has a photographer there waiting to snap a picture of her who's going to pay him and Constance doesn't come out, they ignore him and he goes away. But in the film, he comes back and tries to attack Constance and Mary Cat kills him. She um, hits him over the head and kills him. So there's no ambiguity in the film whatsoever, you know, that Charles is that bad that he's physically attacking both of them. Mary Cat murders him but to protect her sister, which she also did. Um, she also murdered her father to protect her sister uh, in the film, not in the book. The book is very ambiguous as to why she's done any of the things that she's done. But the film makes it very clear that we are supposed to find Mary Cat like a kind of anti-hero. And I think it will satisfy a lot of people more than the book might. Some people might not like the ambiguity in the book. I personally enjoyed it because it gave us a lot to think about and to debate. Um, and Mary Cat's not a straightforward character, uh, which she isn't necessarily in the film either. But the film has a much more satisfying narrative, or some people might find it a more satisfying narrative. So, yeah, I thought I'd pop in here and mention that because that was a huge difference at the end of the film. And also they give a reason as to why Mary Cat murdered their family and the idea is hinted at in the film that dad, Mary Cat's dad, was abusing Constance. Um, whether that's sexually or physically, I don't know, I can't remember where it's hinted, but it's hinted quite heavily. And also throughout the, in, when she encounters these villagers in this film, they actually call Mary Cat a witch, which is not done blatantly in the book at all, but kind of hinted at that, that she's she thinks of herself as that. So yeah, I really enjoyed the film. I think it's a very um, different, it's an interpretation of the book, uh, but I think it's quite a good one, but there are changes. I think they were, you can see why they were made narratively for the structure of a film, but if you've read, seen the film and not read the book, I'd urge you to read the book. If you've never read the book, I would urge you to read it. If you have read the book, what do you think of it? And do you have, I made any sense of it with my rambling thoughts? I personally think it's like a subverted fairy tale where, we're getting the view of Mary Cat, who in her head is in a fairy tale. So if like we're on the outside, we're inside the fairy tale with the witch looking out at everything that's going on. And at the very end, she gets her happily ever after with just her and Constance. And the you can see they're being left offerings of food by the villagers. They've got children running up and daring themselves to for this legend of these local two sisters who murder or eat children or whatever. They even mention at one point eating children. <laughs> So yeah, I just love that. I love that subverted fairy tale nature of the book. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking now because this is probably far too long a video. I've really enjoyed reading this book. I've really enjoyed talking about it. Talk to me about it in the comments and hopefully I'll see you again here soon. Bye.